The UK Navy claims it's intercepted a suspicious submarine cruising towards the English Channel, and the vessel was reportedly Russian. Polly Boyko has more. This is a story that's appeared in most of the British newspapers today, and it's been coloured uh, with hysteria, really, to varying degrees, depending on what sort of a publication it is. But it goes roughly like this. A Russian submarine has been, quote, intercepted by the British Navy close to British waters. It was first detected in the North Sea, apparently with the help of NATO. And the UK's Ministry of Defence has said that the uh, Staria Skol, as the vessel or the sub is known, is now being escorted by a British Navy ship until it leaves the Strait of Dover. And all the articles point out that the submarine is capable of carrying nuclear weapons. The Pentagon says it was the second unsafe intercept by a Chinese military aircraft of a U.S. plane in less than a month. This time on Tuesday over the East China Sea, a Chinese fighter jet approaching at a high rate of speed, coming within 100 feet of a U.S. Air Force RC-135 reconnaissance aircraft. The U.S. plane on a routine mission in international airspace, according to the Pentagon, when the Chinese aircraft approached at a very high rate of speed. The U.S. saying that was not a safe mission. Now, it was earlier in May when there was another unsafe intercept, according to the Pentagon, in the South China Sea, when two Chinese aircraft again approached a U.S. aircraft in what the U.S. says was international airspace coming within 50 feet of the U.S. plane. But this latest incident came on a day when Secretary of State John Kerry and the U.S. Treasury Secretary Jack Lew were in Beijing conducting talks there, and it comes as Defense Secretary Ash Carter left the region just a few days ago after a press conference in Singapore when he talked about the need to maintain stability in the area of the Pacific where both the Chinese and the U.S. are operating. Barbara Starr, CNN, the Pentagon. North Korea's vicious young dictator exploding with confidence tonight. His government's news anchor uses new, very aggressive language to project Kim Jong-un's threat. Kim Jong-un said we now have the clear capacity to directly and realistically attack American bastards who continue to attempt to invade the Pacific. Kim's just tested two medium-range ballistic missiles. One failed, but weapons monitors call the other one a partial success because the missile flew 250 miles and even briefly entered space. Saying that he can realistically attack Americans and not just the U.S. in general, that's a new level of threatening language from Kim, right? Yes. The, the potential for provocation and, and provocative language is enhanced by Kim uh, by the fact that now he has the technology that goes to match the language. When Kim perfects the so-called Musadon missiles he just tested, experts say he'll be able to strike the Aleutian Islands in Alaska or U.S. military units on Guam. A U.S. intelligence official tells CNN tonight Kim's aggressive language, his celebration of this missile launch, underscores his regime's aspiration to be recognized as a nuclear power. Analysts say Kim also wants to fend off the threat he perceives from his principal enemies, who've just wrapped up a massive military exercise on his doorstep. He wants to deter America from even threatening to intervene. He wants to deter South Korea at the same time, obviously. Um, and to do that, he wants to be able to say, I can attack American bases, kill Americans in their beds. Kim's also believed to be toughening up against the U.S., possibly to extort concessions, an attempt to get sanctions loosened. Although he's solidified his hold on power, analysts say if his economy gets squeezed too tightly, he won't be able to buy off North Korea's elites, and he could be threatened from within. But would this bold, impetuous young leader really provoke the Americans by striking them with a missile? Any real provocation where he fires one missile off that's with a real warhead does some damage, he'll be decimated. Uh, Pyongyang will become essentially a, a bowl of glass, and I think he knows that. Still, there are tens of thousands of Americans in Kim's line of fire. More than 28,000 American troops are deployed in South Korea. Analysts worry tonight that if Kim tries to provoke South Korea with artillery fire, maybe a commando raid, that a mishap, a miscalculation from Kim's forces could harm those Americans, then we could be in for a dangerous escalation.
An important statement on U.S. strategy as far as Syria is concerned. That's what the Secretary of State, John Kerry, is calling an internal memo asking the White House to ramp up military action against Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Aaron David Miller is with us. He's vice president of New Initiatives, distinguished scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center, spent a career as a State Department official working on various peace initiatives. How unusual is it that 51 State Department, mostly career diplomats, write this memo saying, Mr. President, you must start bombing Syrian President Bashar al-Assad's positions. Otherwise, more and more Syrian innocent civ civilians are going to be dead. I think there are two takeaways here. Number one, it's quite unusual. Dissent channel memos could be one, two, three, four individuals. This is a 51, which required probably weeks, if not months, of coordination in order to marshal the arguments. And two, somebody either authorized or not uh, willfully leak the memo. So they've converted a dissent channel memo into what I would call a station identification memo over deep frustration in the State Department uh, with uh, the Obama administration's policies towards Syria. That's, that, that's, that, I think, is the takeaway. Just one other point. I don't think this is an issue, though, for this administration, because it's unlikely that the president is going to reconsider uh, or, or essentially agree with what the diplomats are proposing. Because over this five-year civil war over there, hundreds of thousands of civilians have been killed. Uh, millions have been made homeless internally or externally. And what these diplomats, these career professionals mostly, are saying, Mr. President, you have to do something to stop. And most of those people, they say, were killed by Bashar al-Assad's yeah, regime. I mean, look, 450,000 dead. Let's say 40% of those are regime supporters, which reflect the fact that this is essentially a civil war. If we wanted to fundamentally degrade Assad's military capabilities or actually remove him, we could do it. The question is the eternal question, Wolf. How do you create a military strategy that leads to a sustainable set of political goals? And we've seen what happens in places like Iraq or Libya when no one thinks about the day before, the day after, or even the decade after. And in Syria, it's even more complex. Because the argument is that if Bashar al-Assad goes, let's say, ISIS could come in and take over the whole country. Or any number of other groups uh, that have agendas that are inimical to American interests. Plus, you've got the Russians and the Iranians who are involved to, sac to make big sacrifices on the ground. In the end, the question for this administration or the next is the Russians and the Iranians and Assad are prepared to die in defense of what they consider to be their vital interests. The question is, are we? So this whole peace process, this whole ceasefire that the U.S. and the Russians worked out, that seems to have collapsed. Well, to the degree that it, it can afford uh, temporary suspension so you can get uh, humanitarian aid to people who desperately need it, fine. But it's a convenient cover, I suspect, that the Russians are using, under which they have one foot in the tent, which is the political process, and a lot of feet out in which they continue their military activities in the defense of the regime. One reason the U.S. Uh, under President Obama is not launching airstrikes against Bashar al-Assad's regime is the Russians are deeply embedded there with the Syrian regime. This could potentially lead to U.S.-Russian confrontation. It could, or alternatively, you can end up killing a lot of Iranians. And that clearly, given the administration, The Revolutionary Guard troops exactly. are there. A lot of Hezbollah from Lebanon have come in to help Bashar al-Assad's regime Ira as well. And Iraqi Shia. So the question is, the administration has other equities it's trying to protect. This, look, in whatever happens, this is not going to go down well for the Obama administration. Because years from now, or a year from now, people are going to want to know, could the administration have done more? That's the, that's the key question. Aaron David Miller, thanks for coming in.